What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Transcending Sport Podcast. My name is Rob Cruz, and my guest is Kerry Foster. She is pitching coach extraordinaire. She's out of the Alabama area, longtime friend. Kerry, welcome to the show. Mm-hmm. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> If y'all only knew what we had to go through to get this thing set up. So this is my first video <laughs> podcast because somebody wanted to do a video. So I was like, all right, let me figure, let me see if I can figure this out real quick. So here we go. First, you know, first Rob, I like, seeing your, I, I like seeing your face. <laughs> I, like, ever, I, like, I like seeing your face. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I, first ever video podcast um, for Transcending Sport. Um, our topic is we're going to talk about a couple of different things. I have things that I want to get into, but before we do that, um, let's talk about how you got started in softball. Like, take us back as far as you want to go, um, wherever you want to start from. Like, what? How'd you get it? How'd you get into softball? Did you pitch? Did you play? How did it happen? You're talking about you're talking about little league. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, if I can remember back that far, I remember. Um, Mom and dad always coached me in softball. Um, my brother played baseball a little bit. I guess that's kind of what got me started. And I played part ball and um, did the whole all-star things. We always won all-stars and we traveled around and did that thing until about 11. And um, that's when fast pitch really came to Birmingham. And we had a local college that a guy was teaching fast pitch because I actually started at Slingshot. And... Um, and I was at Sanford doing some lessons and everywhere I went, um, I got a lot of attention from some of the coaches around asking me questions and um, dad just knew from that point that there was a talent there. And so we started traveling around and went to Tennessee, Georgia, wherever we could to try to get some lessons. And that's kind of how I started in softball. Um, then I transferred from a local, my local community um, middle school into a larger district high school so that I could um, get better training, get better resources, get better education. Uh, my mom started working at the local um, school so that I could go there because I didn't live in the district. So got a better education. Um, that's where I started getting seen got on a great travel ball team because of that um, that connection and then started going from there. That's great. Why mm -hmm. pitching? Well, how'd you end up pitching? I have no idea. I think it's because um, on the all-star team, my dad needed somebody to pitch. So he just made me a pitcher. Um, I, I think I was all over the place. My personality is kind of all over the place. So I was full of energy. So dad just had me in the circle and I just ran all over the field wanting to have the ball and then all of a sudden we needed a pitcher and dad was like hey you're gonna pitch and I, I mean I don't know if I, I don't remember ever saying hey I want to be a pitcher um I think it was just something that just happened from when I was five I started slingshotting so so for those who don't know what's what's slingshotting <laughs> so if you're a fast pitch pitcher and you're pitching from nine o'clock it's kind of like that so you stand on the mound and you present the ball and you drop your hand down and back. And then when you come forward, you you throw, you don't go full circle around. Okay. I just want to clarify that because everybody doesn't know what that means. So now we know, know. slingshot. <laughs> um, so fast forward, you end up playing college softball division one. How the heck did that happen? Um, first of all, I'll say, you know, God gave me a lot of talent, resources, and mother and dad that really um, mm -hmm. just pushed me. My dad played um, for Bear Bryant at Alabama, so he's very, like, a structured disciplinarian, whatever, and it was so good because I was kind of all over the place, and I had a passion for, for ball. Not only that, I had a passion to win and a passion mm -hmm. to be good and a passion to dominate and be driven, um, just self-motivated. Um, from an early age, I, I wouldn't necessarily say I was – self-driven and motivated. I just wanted to be good and I wanted to win. Not necessarily wanted to do all the work, um, but I remember dad um, always making me go downstairs and get the bucket. And one time I said, dad, you got two legs, you can get the bucket. I'm just telling you, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't make it past that session very well. Right. Um, but I was going to get that bucket every time and, and hiking it up a hill, throwing on the hill. And every time he missed the ball, I was running down the hill to pick it back up and give it back to him and go sit on my 
you know, stand on the mound and throw another pitch, run down the hill and back. I mean, I, I have videos still from those days of my attitude. And I mean, I just wanted to pitch and be good, but you know, dad had to really install that work ethic in me. So that's kind of, you know, first and foremost. Um, but after that, um, started playing at Hoover um, High School. That was a lo that local school I was talking about. Played on a really good travel ball team where we had college um, players coaching us. And at that time, we had just a few few travel ball leagues. It's not like it was now. And so we were the elite team <clears throat> and that had a lot of the main girls, tra you know, main high school good athletes on it. Um, I think we might have had four or five travel ball teams and we were it. And um, we traveled around and we played in Colorado. We were one of the first organizations to go into Colorado and um, nationals. And we didn't have PGF then, so it was like gold nationals yep. and all the things. So that's kind of how that started. Uh, we got a lot of people recruiting us because we had a great team. Um, we had great coaching staff. We had a lot of committed kids that were very driven, self-motivated. Um, wanted to play in college and so it just just happened I had um, coaches that helped me on my behalf to try to get me seen and what's so funny <clears throat> you know we do we do something called a game that's amazing that um, you installed in a lot of the people that's around you and it's the recruiting service so we actually videotape we do YouTube links we send stuff out I had a VHS so my dad sat out there with this <laughs> this huge video and there was no editing service I think I spent two hours making a t 10 minute video. And by the time I ended up getting my pitches, I was exhausted and probably not throwing hard at all because we were trying to get five good pitches in a row, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's the most miserable experience ever. And I sent that VHS, packaged that up myself and sent it out to 60 division one schools. Um, whether they watched it, that big old VHS, I don't even know. So, um... That, that reminds me of when we, when I first started doing college marketing back in like the late 90s, sitting in a room with two VCRs making copies of, of a videotape to put it in a bubble wrap to send it out yep. via, via mail. I mean, those, are the, those are the difficult days of doing it. <laughs> um, so yeah. you, you end up at UAB. What was that like? <clears throat> Um, it was awesome. It was an awesome experience. It was a first year program. So I was excited to be a part of a first year program. Um, I, was, I didn't realize uh, that was, it was a first year program. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And okay. Um, that was one of the drawing points. You know, you'll be the first person to ever sign here, or commit yeah. here, or whatever. And I love the coach, Marla. She was actually my third grade gymnastics coach and my PE coach for a lot, a long, long time. And okay. when I played at Hoover, she ended up coaching at Pelham. And so I battled her team for four years, ninth through 12th grade. So she saw me compete for four years. So I was one of the first piece, person, first people that she had called um, to, to offer a scholarship to when she got the head coaching job there. That's really nice. That's great. Yeah. So I want to go back to something you said that, that that's just stuck with me. You said that your your work ethic will have been instilled in you by your father at an early age because mm -hmm. because of where he came from the best the best turn best turn <laughs> the bear bryant <laughs> the bear bryant legacy um and mindset and mentality um which he instilled into you which i know you instilled into your daughter but how, how has that work ethic transferred and translated and i know the answer to this but i want to i want you to communicate it to, to the audience into what you do now currently with with how you structure what you do with your with your with your athletes um i think for me it made me more of a kind of like a perfectionist like analytical kind of coach um i want to know all the reasons why i want to know how how to get them better like my drivenness and my work at it's to a flaw flaw at at, at some point and i'll tell you why because Every kid that comes in, I want to make them like the. I, I want to pretend they're they're going to the top five power schools in America. You know, like, and realistically, that's not everybody's future. Yeah. You know, we know that. Um, it's top five percent of athletes will actually go in the top, or maybe two percent. I mean, I don't know the statistics, but it's very limited 
who's yeah. actually going to make it to the top schools. Um, and so, but my heart is to n- not discriminate with any kid that comes in, no matter where their ability is at that point in time, because I know um, with the mindset, right mindset, work ethic, ability, um, and the right coaching, we can get them very, very far in yeah. their career. Um, and so to, to the flaw I was speaking of is I would expect more out of them than their body could actually do. And so therefore I would end up pushing them harder than they needed to be pushed. And so in my 20 years of coaching, I had to learn and even in their motivation, some kids are just coming in just to make middle school balls so they don't get made fun of. Some people are just coming in just to please their dad. Some people want to go play ball but never have the ambition to play in the top schools in the nation that was that's not everybody's goal even though we think it is and so as a coach i had to really assess that so when a kid comes in that's one question and like i'm assessing that within the first couple of sessions like where are they at where do they want to be what are their goals are they just trying to make a travel ball team because it's gonna it's gonna determine how i coach them with that being said, every kid is going to get coached the same structure. Yeah. Um, I feel like there's a freedom of movement with their body in what is allowed um, when they pitch. There's going to be certain things that's just them. There's going to be certain ticks that's just them. But there's also certain fundamentals that have to be in place. One for protection and um, injury prevention. But that go what goes along with that is speed and accuracy. If you don't have protection and and, and your body has that integrity in the structure, then you're not gonna fully be able to, to move your body mechanically in the best way as possible. And so when I'm looking at their structure and their body and making sure every one of the pieces are, are kinetically working together, then it's gonna produce maximum amount of results and in the end, we have less injuries. Yeah. So those kind of things is how, what, how my dad, and you know, when he installed work ethic and drivenness it's like a drive to make kids better a drive like how can i educate myself how can i make myself better who can i surround myself with Mm -hmm. that um that may spring an idea or brainstorm with or whatever so i love the community of pitching coaches and hitting coaches and college coaches and because everybody has something to bring to the table if you're willing to listen and and learn yes so Flashback to, you know, how our relationship started. So, uh, you know, we, I came, the first time I came down to Alabama, I don't know if you remember this or not, but we, I came down to, um, what's that high school? Uh, of a state, was it? You were, we, um, Caroline, Kim and I, yeah, called yep. you. So you and Kim got me on the phone and somehow <laughs> contacted me. I guess you guys got a hold of the book and, um, we saw a YouTube video on, um, Fast Pitch TV. Is that what it was? Yeah, we watched all your videos. Okay, okay. So I ended up coming down, and we did. We put we took, put together something over at Miss David Hills High School, which is great. Um, mm-hmm. And then we got, we developed this relationship um, to be able to figure out how we can get, get the kids in that area better. That that was your goal. That was I, yeah. I you know, that was what you were. And I was like, wow, you know, let, all right, let's do it. Um, so mm-hmm. what I noticed about you, though, specifically you and how you do pitching and how, you know, I'm, I'm, about, I'm about results. So I go all over the country. I see all these pitching coaches um, that do pitching lessons. And I'm, I have air quotes, as you can see, <laughs> they do pitching lessons. <laughs> and people spend money on pitching lessons, you know. But what I've been noticing is people are pitching three, four, five years. I mean, that's way too long. Two years is way too long. A year is way too long to pitch and not really get better. Yeah. Like your your your, veloc- months. your velocity. Six months is too long. Your velocity has not gone up. Yeah. And I think there's a balance between I love my pitching coach. I enjoy working in that environment with my pitching coach. Mm-hmm. And is she getting me better? And when yeah. I talk to people on the phone, I, you know, they ask me um, about, sometimes I have people I, I'm asking me about pitching coaches and I'm like, um, 
I don't know. You, you want to get on a plane? <laughs> I don't know how many people I've sent to Alabama. <laughs> you've, sent, you've sent a lot. I have a lot of people that fly here. Yeah. <laughs> and people like to think I'm crazy. I'm like, okay, you're going to think I'm crazy. But until you go down there and do one, I promise you it will, be, it will not be your last one. And you'll see the difference. And you'll come back and you'll say, yeah, there's, there's no one that's, there's no one like me. And I know you're just being you, but and, and but how, why is it different? What have you done to set yourself apart? And do you purposely do that? Or are you just being uniquely you? And why are you so effective in, in how you get athletes to make giant leaps and bounds and improvement? Quickly. I almost tell people, and I've told this to people before, by the way. I've told people, I've said to them, I will guarantee you at least two to three miles an hour on the spot with Kerry, or I will pay for your lesson. I've said that to people. Yeah, I remember that. One of them said, the only reason I'm here is because Rob promised me he'd pay for our trip down here if you didn't get me faster. I, I didn't say like, I'd pay for that whole precious. trip. <laughs> I didn't say I'd pay I for think, the whole trip. I think they were trying to get all of it. <laughs> but because that's how much I know, like, you know, you know what I'm saying? So like, what's different? What's unique? Um, I'll say, I'll say this, and I know, um, it sounds cliche or whatever, but God has given me an ability, one, to, to teach. That is a spiritual gift. My father had it. I have it. It is a spiritual gift. The Lord has given me to be able to explain things where kids can understand it, to make that connection. Maybe another coach or their dad has been saying, but to explain it or, or, physically allow them to feel something that they haven't been able to feel before. The other is I do, I pray, I pray over my kids before they come into lessons and I pray for words of knowledge and wisdom. I pray for tons of wisdom because there are things right now that are coming out like this whole forearm fire, forearm fire and, and whipping and all that stuff that I never had a, a marketing marketing label on I just understood it it was like I saw something in a lesson and I was like that's what what does it and it's like God just opens my eyes to see things and create I'm very creative yeah. um, I like creating things for kids to feel to understand there was something that happened the other day by mistake um, a girl threw the ball behind her and almost hit my face and right then immediately, I was like, that's gonna fix all these arm circle issues. That's real. Like she did it by mistake, but God just dropped it in my spirit. That's gonna fix all your arm issues. And I, I can't tell you how or why, but he gives me the, the wisdom and knowledge to be able to see things, teach things. So to me, it's a spiritual gift. I think um, to be able to teach is a gift. A lot of people can't teach. A lot of people can't explain. Right. There is a teacher. So yeah. mm -hmm. First and foremost, that's it. Um, I think number two is being a constant learner um, and trying to figure things out. Like if I get a kid that that I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I've, I've done all eight drills that I know is supposed to fix this issue um, and it's not working. I'm like, Lord, you're going to give me something. Like, And then all of a sudden something I just drop in my spirit and I'll go, let's, let's try this. And maybe the next week, it, you know, something else that come, I'll, I'll get it with another kid and then I'm like, this is what she didn't get. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just, I can't, I can't explain it, it's, but I have a passion to get kids better. And that's what, that's what springs on, you know, the constant education, learning, talking about it. And it's not about the money for me. Like I told a kid the other day, if I could fin financially do one kid every 30 minutes, I would do that one. Because I think there is a, um, I'll, t I'll tell you one other thing. <clears throat> There's something to be said for a kid that trusts their coach. If you can get a kid to trust you, and trust comes from caring, trust comes from relationship building. And then the female, as you know, a man, the female will trust you. If they come into a lesson, a female comes into any kind of relationship, and you wrote a book about emotional intelligence, and they emotionally don't connect with you, they emotionally don't trust you, then they're not gonna believe anything you say. It don't matter, I could be I could be famous, you know, wherever, and they would not trust me. 
they got to know first that I care for them. <clears throat> so I'll be honest with you, my first two sessions, my first session is all about understanding the mechanics of pitching. It's not about pitching. I want to show you what a, what your pitching mechanics should look like. Then I'm going to show you a video of what you look like. And then they go, aha, that's the first thing. The second thing is to tell them I'm with you the whole way. You're going to get there. You're going to be there. I'm going to help you through it. It's, you know, whatever. And then from there on, the the exponential growth won't happen until their brain allows them to trust me. If they're still in their brain saying, my other pitching coach said do this, my dad says do this, that's a whole nother tangent, then that dad is delaying their process of getting better. Mm -hmm. And so that relationship between kid and coach has to happen despite what the dad, mom says, coach says, high school coach says, all that. Once she understands what I teach mechanically and then my emotional ability to connect with her, I can have a kid change like that. So let me ask you this. Just because you pitched, let me go back, <laughs> let me go back. Just because you played Division One softball doesn't make you a great pitching coach. It helps, but the teaching gift is is probably the the, the, the major driving force. Because I think a lot of people can know things because we got the internet. We got the internet in our pockets, so I can go on YouTube and, and I can learn things and know things. But communicating it and having the teaching gift, which not everybody has, you say yeah. that would be that. You you would, you would say that that's that's what separates. Yeah. 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 Being, a ma being a master teacher is, is it, it, it comes from the, the teaching game. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll say one more thing. I was thinking about this earlier. Um, you have a lot of people trying to teach pitching. Mm -hmm. They may have pitched. Yep. The way I look at it, like for here, I have dads that I've coached their daughter and they try to teach pitching. I have kids that have taught and I have only a couple of them that I say, you could be a great teacher. Holly Ward's one of them. Leah Streetman's another one of them. Like, these are kids that I'm like, you're gonna be a pitching coach. You understand it, you feel it, and you can communicate it. And I've been coaching for 20 years and there's probably two students, that, two, may, may, maybe five, that I say that can, can actually teach on that kind of level. level. However, is their expertise where they need to be because where I'm at and I've had 20 years of failure that I had to succeed through and work my way through, they don't have that. Mm -hmm. So yes, they can teach, but will it take you longer to get there because they don't have the work knowledge, the experience to get you there faster? See what I'm saying? But going back to so, what you said about your passion though. Yeah. Huh? I'm saying, going back to saying what you said about your passion, because your passion fueled your inquisitiveness of wanting to yes. know more like most coaches yeah. don't go above above and beyond to learn more they just teach what they did or they teach what and they, they saw their they, pitching they, coach teach their daughter right and every now and then they'll pick up something along the way but they just teach what they did like i did this so you should you should be able to do this and, instead of and here yeah and here's another thing you, you remember that game you played as a kid where you whisper something in one kid's ear and they whisper it all the way around yep. and it gets back. If you're not going to the source, then you're getting what's been whispered eight times around. I said you're this getting eight night. different pitching. You're, you're getting eight different pitching instructors spewed all into your daughter. You're getting eight different mechanical styles spewed into your daughter. You're getting chaos spewed into your daughter because you're, you're taking lessons from somebody that is either close, cheap, or you're connected with it's the copy it's the it's the it's the copy it's not there it's yeah it's the copy of the copy of get, the copy yeah and and so what you're doing is it's it's just it's chaotic and so i'll be honest with you i will get a kid and i can tell you the last three pitching coaches she's had wow and it's a mix of all of them mm -hmm. and i and then i i have to go back and destroy every lie that she's been taught mm -hmm and the deception that she's believed 
to be able to produce fruit in her body. Mm -hmm. And that right there is frustrating. It is, it, it, I'm passionate about that because it makes me mad that they are lying to you, not on purpose, and taking your money because they do not understand pitching. They do not understand mindset. They do not understand biomechanics, body. They've never thrown a ball. Half of them have not even thrown a ball. Mm -hmm. So if you can't feel it, how do you teach it? It's more than just snap, nine o'clock, full circle, snap and finish or whatever you want to teach. It's way more than that. But then again, if their desire is not to do anything but play part ball their whole life, then it really don't matter who you go to. So I, I think most people, this is based on my experience, most people don't know the difference. They, they think finding a pitching coach, just like finding a hitting coach, is like going to get a slice of pizza. It's just pizza. Yeah. It's just, I'm going to, it doesn't matter where I get my pizza from, it's just pizza. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it's not just pizza. It, it's, um, it's, it's not. But most people don't know that there's a big difference from who you, who you, who you instruct from, who you get instruction from. Um, because they don't know the yeah. difference between good and bad instruction. They just know that, oh, so you got a pitching coach. Oh, we have a new pitching coach now. Oh, we got, you know, mm, no. There's a mm -hmm. reason why, you know, and we talked we talk about this. There is actually a legacy current that's currently being, we're seeing it on TV. We're seeing it, we're seeing it um, in, the, in the SEC and certain conferences with certain pitching coaches that all go back to pretty much one or two people. Yeah. If you, if you go back and look at all the pitching coaches that are at the top of the food chain right now in the whole entire country, they're about two, maybe three people away from one or two people. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm, I'm not giving out that top secret information right now, but I, but you know, no. we know this. But I think, it, I think it goes back to even local pitching coaches. There's several um, pitching coaches online that I'm friends with mm -hmm. um, that you can tell will develop great athletes. Um, there's one locally. Um, Amber Torres was a student of mine. She's another one that I'd say she's local and she can really teach and she's good. Um, but it, there, there's something to, um, I just lost my thing. Train of thought. What are you saying? No, I was just saying that most people don't know the difference between, you know, good, good and bad, good and good and great instruction. They just think, they just think instruction is instruction. Um, but, yeah, I don't know what I was gonna say. So, what are what are the qualities? What are the mental, emotional qualities for the for the players? And, and for me, um, on the hitter side, I think when I'm working with hitters, you know, you can have such great talent, and you swing in the bat. You have great bat speed, great whip. You got a feel for the for the for, for for hitting. You have the feel for hitting. But there's something else that's required of you to be able to play at a specific level. Um, the top 10 level, the top 15 or 20 level. Um, mm -hmm. For you as a pitching coach, how do you identify, and it, it can't just be velocity, obviously, it can't just be talent, but how do you identify, okay, this kid is going to be super special at a high level? Do you know right she away? She misses the bat. <laughs> yeah, she misses the you bat. Know, you know right away. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about... Um, what she can do physically, though. I'm talking about on a moment. No, I, no, I know. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you got to miss the bat. Yeah. You miss the bat, no matter what. You you have a visual visual ability to see bat path, to see bat consistency, <laughs> and you can miss the bat. No What's matter, no matter what. And here's here's the, here. Let me, can I get on another tangent? But wait, so so strikeouts. No, missing the bat, pop-ups, weak okay. ground balls, okay. strikeouts. Okay. You miss the bat because here's the thing. When I threw, and this again was a gift, and everybody don't have this. When when the bat swung, here comes the bat, boom, here. And I saw her swing on deck, and I saw her swing. I could immediately see flaws in her swing, and I could, I could see, like, spots would just light up for me she'll never hit that spot 
She'll never hit that spot. She'll never hit that spot. You know, and so when I would, when my co- coach say that's this, this is where her swing, her back path was, and she didn't make great adjustments, and she never could get her hands in to get this right here. My coach called a fastball. By God, that fastball was gonna be here. So not not only take away being able to hit spots, you know, and all that stuff, but if she called a curveball and I knew that she was swinging that <clears throat> she was swinging down here and she was falling off my drop ball, my curveball was up here. Being able to change planes and miss the bat based on <clears throat> her flaws and her swing. Hmm. And so a- if you can't see that, if you can't read hitters, I, I can I, I could read hitters. That's why I do teach hitting lessons. One, I've been around you enough, one of the best hitting coaches in the nation, so I know structurally what it's supposed to do. It's so similar to pitching, I can make my pitchers feel what they need to do hitting because it's very similar and I'm already teaching it pitching-wise. But then I can see what's jacked up about their swing and based on what I've learned from you and what my experience was in college, I can make them do that again, coach them through, explain, let them feel what they're supposed to do. But for a pitcher, what makes them great is when their high school coach calls a fastball inside and she says, well, she hits fastballs inside over the fence and I couldn't shake it off. I said, you should have missed the bat. There's, There's one spot inside that she could not hit. Right. I mean, not, not right. There's, there's got to be a spot she can't hit hard. So it's funny. You said, um, <laughs> you said a whole lot. But I, I, when I talk to pitching coaches, uh, there's about three or four pitching coaches that are SEC pitching coaches, right? That I've spoken to, like, in depth. Yeah. Like, and I, re- I realize when I talk to them about pitching, and they're talking to me about pitching, they're really talking to me about hitting. Mm-hmm. Because. In order for them to be able to call pitches at that level and watch video of hitters at that level. Remember, pitching coaches watch more video of hitters than hitting yeah. coaches actually do, just so you know, people in, in the podcast land. Yeah. So pitching yeah. coaches and pitchers at that level have sat in a room and watched so many hitters. So if you're a hitter and you want to get another perspective, talk to your pitching coach. Trust me on that one. Because they trust me on that one, because they know they know stuff just from watching years and years and hours and hours of watching haters on video. They have to know yep. what's going on. We'll, I mean, we'll pick out your weakness right away. All day. And All so, day. as a good pitcher, you have to be able to pick out that weakness and be able to throw to your strengths yep. and be effective in the situation in the game. That's a lot of this. That doesn't come naturally. Mm-hmm. Okay. And sometimes cannot be taught. So I think what you what you what you're saying to me is, and it's funny. I just got finished talking about this. An athlete's an athlete's ability to visualize, imagine, and predict mm. contributes to her ability to be successful, especially at a high level. Because yeah. if you can't. You can't visualize, see it, and predict what's what, what's going to happen. It's hard for you to be able to play at a high level because it's, yeah. it's a lot more anticipation going on than there is um, reacting going on. You got to be ahead of it. Did you say visualize, analyze, and predict? No, I said visualize, imagine. Imagination is really big in that, and, yeah. predict, and being able to predict. And that's and, that starts. And that starts in 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 practice yeah. you know like you visualize where you're pitching mm-hmm. you imagine where the ball is going to go you create success in your brain before you do it and then you predict what's happening and that brings success now check stop right there now with hitters it's the same thing because i'm a i'm a i'm about a fraction of a second or two fractions of a second and i had of where i have to be as the ball is coming in i can't be on the ball yeah now, now i'm late I have to be a little bit out in front of where the ball is going to be. And, and, if you, and people who have the ability to do that, it's not even something that I can really articulate or it's not even something that I can really, really, I mean, yeah, I can, yeah we could teach it. But some people have an innate ability to do it already. Like they just have do this you, gift of 
How yeah, but I think some of that, some of that's like what you call visual cachet. Mm -hmm. If you've oh. seen a spin of the ball so many dang times that when you release the ball, you you can predict where that ball's going or the area that it's going. Yeah. <laughs> so the that's not, but it's it's not necessarily trained. It's a gift yeah. to be able to see that stuff. Well, some that's people true. just can't see it. That's true. But, but guess some what? of it can be trained. Mm -hmm. You know, just like in pitching, some of that can be trained in how I teach you, but some of that's just got to take over naturally or it don't take over naturally. So that's that's the separation between division one in or or big and not. Or be, it's whether they be, grasp or being able to hit faster pitches. So I'll give you an example. I'm in front toss. I'm talking front toss, okay? Front toss. <laughs> I said it three times on purpose. Um, I'm tossing to a person at five miles an hour. And this hitter is late five straight times. Now, I can say to them, how are you late five times on front toss? You need me to tell you to swing, to swing, swing earlier? Why should I have to tell you that? Then you, have the other, then you have the other person who's late on one pitch, and then she visually visualizes the change and she's never late for the rest of the at bat. My question becomes, why do I have to tell you to do something different to not be late five straight times? So what's happening to you in a game now? I, I feel like there's, there's multiple reasons why. One is because these kids are living in a society that they don't think everything's been handed to them. They don't think for themselves. Everything's digital on, you know, there's there's no practical games. There's nothing they're doing outside that's causing their brain to figure things out and make adaptions to. Number two, they live in fear of somebody yelling at them that they can't, they're paralyzed and will not and cannot make a decision or they've always been told what to do so they never think of themselves. Yeah, I think that's a big part of it. It's, it's the conditioning. It's the mind conditioning. It's conditioning. Not, I mean, and then other than that, I mean, they think they, their brains have been it. conditioned. How, you're, 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 you're right. I think brain, their brains have been conditioned over time, from five years old, six years old, seven years old, eight year old, all the way up, to where it starts to show up in how they play the game. Yeah. You know, so, um, and it goes back to something that you said earlier. You mentioned. Um, that you, you have creativity as a coach, creativity, mm -hmm. uh, which allows you to be able to do things like the stuff I see you posting with the soda bottles and the stuff, you know, all the things you're doing, or mm -hmm. the water bottles or whatever, all you know, things that you're doing that are just different because you have the ability to say, I'm going to do that. And by the way, it takes a lot of courage as a coach to be creative. It's easier to just copy what somebody else already did. But it's harder, or not harder, should be easier. But it's, it takes more courage to say, I'm going to try something that no one else has done. And mm -hmm. if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But if it does work, I, 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 I created something that, was, that, that, that can help someone. Yeah. But most people and most coaches are not willing to have that creativity that we need, that we need you to have as coaches and that innovation. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> <coughs> that innovation um, that's necessary to, to, to advance the game of softball, to advance all sports. Because movement's movement. So you have the ability to see movement. You see somebody move, and you say, okay, there's a better way that this person can move. Now, how do I get them to do it? Yeah. I think that's the biggest challenge for pitching coaches. And for me, being creative is the funnest part of my job. Yeah. So talk to me about your accountability structure. <clears throat> How does that work? What do you mean? With, okay, with accountability, your accountability system. Um, how you hold your kids accountable for the information that you give them. Is that something um, that you actually think about or is this, is this part of who you are or? When no, I haven't thought about it. It, it kind of is the product of who I am because when they come back in and they, they, ha I can tell right off whether they practice or not. So they, they're going to get the question, hey, how did your week go? What have you been practicing? What's working? What's not working? What are we working on today? Did you do the drills I asked you to do? Some kids actually, I've, I've encouraged to bring a journal. 
I have figured out some kids do better with their trigger words written out or what they're doing out on a sheet of paper. So I have a, I have a notebook and a pen sitting on the floor and they can write whatever they want to take the paper with them and go home. Mm -hmm. I have one girl that legit wrote her stuff on her glove. And the next week she came in amazing. She needed that trigger of she, she, she's a little ADD. So she, it was for her, it's what worked. Um, cause I told her, I didn't love this. If you have to write this on your glove, you write on your glove and you read it before you pitch. Mm -hmm. Because every time you say this to yourself, it works. And so she legit wrote down her trigger words for all three pitches. And when she came in the next week, it looked phenomenal. She said, I read my glove every, 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 she said, I read my glove every pitch of every, every practice. You know how many times she said she repeated me in her head when she pitched? Wow, great. So what, you know what I'm saying? So, um, I, the biggest challenge I have is the kids coming to lessons. They pay to get the knowledge and they do nothing with it. They go back home and they warm up the same way they warm up. They don't do one drill that I usually teach them to do. It's like if I don't spell it out at the end of a session and say, here's your workout plan, let me journal it out for you, they won't do it. It's not like I can reteach them something in a lesson and say, okay, let's not do your nine o'clock like this anymore. Let's do it like this because of this. They'll come back the next week still doing it like they've done the last 20 years. Okay. It's well, like it doesn't well, resonate. Can I say something to you? Yeah. No, it's not even, I'm, I'm gonna ask you a question. Whose fault is that? I think it's mine because I no. don't do a great job of, no, I, no, I feel like, <laughs> I feel like we take for granted as mm -hmm. coaches and parents okay. that the translation is, is going from um, brain to I'm supposed to do this. I don't think they're making that connection. So I have, on my part, I, it, it's parents' fault too, but I have done a better job saying at the end of the session, this is how I want you warming up. This is specifically the three drills I want you working on this week. That's helped 50% of it. The other is either they don't practice, the dad don't care, the dad's not helping them, they're just sitting on a bucket or they expect somebody else to do it. The main problem is most parents are too busy and they want the kid to work on their own. And that's not what made me great. What made me great is having a dad that pushed me, that made me practice, even when I didn't want to, it was that accountability. Nobody at 16 wants to work. They'd rather be on the phone and in the car at the parking lot and having fun with their friends. There is 1% of the population that wants to actually be working at home instead of going to movies with their friends. So I did, I did a podcast, my last one before this one, we, we talked about, um, the characteristics of what makes somebody elite and, and a lot of it is mindset but a lot of it mm -hmm. is parenting also you know mm -hmm. a big part of it is parenting well a big part of everyone's mindset is their parenting yeah because uh, you're a product of that so I, I don't believe that children on a large scale have the, you're talking about if, I, if i'm talking to a hundred a hundred kids maybe two or three of them are gonna be able to do what you just said on their own without, without a parent pushing. Maybe two or three of them out of 100 are gonna have the drive, discipline, level of passion to do what you just said on their own. And the other, 95, the other 95% are gonna be driven and pushed and held accountable by parents. It's, it's, it's a combined effort, it's, it's teamwork. It's a community effort. Yeah. It's everybody working together, you, the coach, the teachers, the high school coach, the travel ball coach, to push a player and hold them accountable to a standard of what we know it looks like. So yeah. But, so what I, I made a statement, I said every single athlete that I've had, whether they played division one, two or three, who reached a high level or the pinnacle of this of, of their success or who was the best version of themselves. If you put all their parents in a room, those people are all the same in terms of how they, what they did and how they put. Because you have some okay. that say, well, I don't really want to push her. If she wants to do this, this is, this is her thing. Um, okay. It, it's like schoolwork. Okay. If, if I'm going to get you a tutor in math, I'm going to get you an SAT or an ACT uh, instructor in math. I'm going to hold you accountable to get those your grades to a certain level. 
why is it different with sports? Why, why are we making it different? I got you a piano lesson, I got you a piano, I'm getting piano lessons, I'm making sure I'm spending all this money on these piano lessons. You're gonna sit down and do exactly what she told you to do. I'm gonna make sure. Yeah. Why, do you have, why do you have an A plus? Why do you not have an A plus? Why do you have a B? Why is that different? Why is school different? Why, why is it okay to push them for school, but it's not okay to push them in sports? That, that's Cause my who's the one having, who's the one having, do, who's having, who's the one having to do all the pushing? The parents. In <laughs> well, school, yeah. at least you have a teacher pushing them. We hope we do. Well, if the teacher was pushing them, everybody, everybody's not an A plus student. Too many people want to hand their kids, like too everybody's many not A plus. Hand their kids off. And I think, because they're busy and they're tired. I, I think you, I mean everybody's busy and tired, but you got to make a decision of what how you uh, am I busy and tired? Yeah. Are you busy and tired? Yeah. <laughs> We're all busy and tired, but you still have to find time because you're trying to teach your child what it takes to make it. You have to push through that. But everybody don't have that drivenness. So if the parents ain't got it, then the kids ain't. It's not going to be insulted in the kids either. People going to work nine to five and complain they're in debt and can't get out they ain't got the discipline to <laughs> they got the discipline to quit spending or go get another job work two jobs you see what i'm saying we, we, we're still dealing we're dealing with parents that don't have that structure depth in them yeah, so much less install it in their that, kid that, that's my biggest um thing is i have to i have to try to find more ways to try to inspire um the, the, the parents to, to do a little bit more, to be a little bit yeah. more um, involved and a little bit more pushy and a little bit more demanding of, of what they want out of their children in the area of sports as well as in the area of education because you're doing that kid a disservice because she could be really good and she could be really and really go further. But she's yeah. scratching the surface. And she's borderline mediocre, as a matter of fact. And, and I, have to, I have to communicate that. And yeah, it hurts some feelings. Yeah. It, it ruffles some feathers. It hurts some feelings. It's, it, 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 it's not a comfortable conversation, but it's a necessary conversation. And it's a conversation that I'm willing to have with people out of love, especially if you ask me, yeah. hey, what, what, does it take to get to, what does it take to get her to the next level? We're spending a lot of money. We're traveling. We're getting on planes. We're renting cars. We're playing on these, on these teams. We're going to showcases. We're going to college camps. Like, what, what's, what's next? And if you really want to know the answer to that question, and you really ask me to answer that question, I'm, um, I have to tell you the answer to that question. And that's, 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 the, <laughs> I guess that's the hard part of our job, but it's not, it's not hard for you yeah. anymore. It's easy now because if you want to set yourself apart, then you'll set yourself apart. Um, so you, you have this, uh, online training program. Tell us a little bit about it. Um, well, the biggest thing is I have courses. Um, I've taken the time to sit down and teach what I teach. Like if somebody was going to come in and do a lesson with me, say the fastball course, the first session is going to look like this. I'm going to teach the knowledge, the understanding, positioning, and the why behind what we do, what we do. And when you understand the why, then you're all in. You, you know what you're supposed to do. I feel like too many parents are getting fed from 80 different online pigeon coaches like YouTubers and Instagram influencer pigeon coaches that they're trying there's there's number one there's too many dads trying to teach pitching lessons they're trying to teach their kid because they think they know or because they watch it on a video or they watch this instagrammer and they try to even my even i have dads that would come to me what do you think about this what do you think about that well there's a reason i didn't teach that here's the reason you know they're always looking to to learn and gain but then they start feeding all this to their kids and i just wanted clarity i feel like it's so so um easy to get in the that world of just gaining all this information and i wanted them to have a system that would take them all through all four pitches right. and the system is based on these fundamentals in the fastball this is what your mechanics are i'm teaching your ground foundation your stance your whip your arm circle reason your ball path needs to go straight if you don't understand ball path and breaking points then don't go start with a curveball because you you don't have the foundation so i built everything on the foundation of the fastball and the fastball is not really a fastball it's the structure it's your base structure that now you're going to build everything on 
And um, so once that, then they can move into another pitch, a change up. And I give five different change up in the change up courses. Then I give a drop ball and the drop. So it's like having me in your pocket telling you one thing versus getting your information from eight, 20, 50 different places and, and just going based on that. And then from those courses, they can have an online session with me. I can explain to them what they're doing. They can tell me where they're at in their courses. And then I can say, hey, you're ready for the next course. And so when they go out to the ball field, they just play the video. This is snaps, this is T-drill, this is full circle, this is, and, and I even give them suggestions for each one. Today, you know, you can do the big ball. Today, you're gonna do a spinner, to, you know. And so it gives them the accessibility to have great information and knowledge, a system to abide by that will take you through the same, that's built upon itself through the whole, whole five pitches. And you have access to me if you want lessons and I can translate, better translate or say, hey, why don't you try this drill versus this drill? And, and they can have a pitching coach in their pocket, basically. So and without all the expenses and the traveling. How do they sign up for that? <clears throat> um, they can go to fosterfastpitch.com and um, under that, it'll just say um, courses, online instruction, all that. Um, you can find me on Foster Fast Pitch on Instagram. There's a link in my bio, um, any of that. Or they can just message me on social media. Okay. That's good enough. And so what's next for Carrie? What's next? What's new and exciting? Um, I am <laughs> looking at um, building a community where um, I give more of this kind of instruction um in inspiration to kids <clears throat> coaching to dads um clarity i just feel like there needs to be a lot of clarity um and i'm looking to build a, like a, a online community where they have access to me information that i'm giving out pouring into um practice plans how to get the most out of your kids i'm working on developing something like that and then having my courses be into that just I'm excited about some things that are coming up. Just trying to, I'm at the blueprint of it though right now. Mm -hmm. um, I know you just recently went to Auburn. Yeah. To participate in a research study. Mm -hmm. On a number of different things. And I'd like you to, if you, if you're not, if you can just elaborate a little bit on what the experience is like and what you got yeah. out of it and all that good stuff. Um, so I had a kinesiology background as well, um, did not major kinesiology, just had a lot of courses in it, <clears throat> excuse me. And so when she was speaking, it was speaking my language because I understood exactly what she was talking about. Mm -hmm. And, um, Dr. Gretchen Oliver okay. at the University of Auburn okay. and you can find her, um, on Instagram as well. And uh, so she was doing some training and she was measuring ground force. Like she had a, a, um, a block that they would start on and then a place where they would land. It would measure how much force is going from the ground and landing into the ground. Um, they had electrodes all over the body. So you could actually see skeletal movement um, on the screen as they were pitching. And so I could, I could see a number of different things. Um, the one thing that I noticed the most is um, more of the folding at the hips when they pitch. I saw the locking of the knee, which caused the folding of the hips. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a drill that I do that I haven't enforced enough. Um, and now it's actually something I do every single lesson. And it's something that I activate every single lesson now and has produced major amount of speed. I'm talking two to three miles an hour each kid. Wow. And it has to do with a kinetic chain of force growing going into the ground from the front knee active activating your hamstring which activates the glute um i mean um and then it activates the lat and so we talk about whip and forearm fire but if you're constantly throwing with your shoulder and not activating your lat through driving up through your hamstring and glutes then it's never going to activate and she was talking about how she didn't even really 
stretch muscles, she activated muscles. If you don't activate them, they won't turn on, which is, and, and it was just this bright light that came on in my brain, which is the same thing that happened when I had an injury in college and I had worked hand in hand with therapists to retrain my body how to pitch. And that's how I teach pitching now. Um, I had a herniated disc and um, labrum and rotator cuff tear. Never had to have surgery because I changed the way I was throwing. And in that, I gained four miles an hour. Um, but I was doing all the therapy in the, in the ther with the, all the therapists, but it would never translate into pitching. I would come back with the same injuries. They came out to me and taught me how to activate in the middle of my pitch. So I could have abs and steel, but if I never engaged my abs and my lats when I pitch, then I was constantly rotating my spine, causing my herniated disc to be inflamed. Hmm. So until I learned to pitch correctly and activate those muscles that would support my body, um, I was constantly getting injured. So with that mentality of understanding activation, I understood people cannot get arm whip until they activate their legs. Understand ground force. Understand the kinetic chain that makes each thing work and the sequence of events that has to happen before. And I mean, you can pitch all day long, but if you want to get to 70 miles an hour and, and if you want to hit 65 as, as your five foot four kid, then those things have to be set up perfectly or we're always missing something. Yeah. And we've always got room to grow. So that was a little bit of what triggered, you know, when I got to speak to her, she, she's amazing. And how much of it was um, injury prevention based or was most of it injury prevention based? Was it just about power and generating more or was it about doing it in an efficient manner to reduce the risk of injury or to avoid injury altogether? For her, it was more about functionality. Um, yeah. She didn't understand anything about softball. It was her speaking kinesiology to me and me being able to be like, oh, okay. this is how it translates into mm -hmm. pitching. Because of my connection with kinesiology, because she's an amazing teacher, and because I was creative enough to, to assess the whole situation and say, this is what has to happen. Right. Um, it, she she is, is injury prevention. That's her main thing is injury prevention. Oh, okay. But it's baseball, softball, um, pitching, and hitting. She's just now getting into hitting. Um, the way she coached Auburn was she had no clue. She was basically the pitching coach at Auburn. I mean, they had, they had pitching coaches, but they worked hand in hand with her. And whatever she said they did, they bought her out for a whole season. She traveled oh. with them. She took measurements. And if they were weak on their hips, then she activated it until it got stronger so that when they pitched, it wouldn't be weak and cause, cause um, um, like, I guess, weakness where they would compensate and get injured or it would cause, the compensation would cause a lack of movement or lack of speed. So every, when they coach, they coach scientifically, not mechanically. Gotcha. Hmm, that's different. Mm hmm That's different. So she's got numbers and she's got, um there's some things that she's going to send to me about my two kids that went down there but there's some numbers that their hips have to read to have complete um ability to use their legs and hips during their pitch and okay. so like my my internal rotation had to be 45 degrees my internal rotation was 23. Hmm. needed to be 45 to fully function without back injury my kids my kids were in the 20s too so she's going to put together a plan for me, which will prompt my workout regimen, warm up session prior to pitching. And she said some pitchers can do this warm up and activate their muscles. 15 minutes, some will take 45. One of the pitchers at Auburn now takes 45 minutes. You know what's funny? I, <laughs> I'm going to say this. So I was, when I was coaching the Pride, right? Yeah. We had that we, it was one series where we went to Tennessee. And um, this is when the Tennessee Diamonds were a team, were a pro team. Mm -hmm. And so I would get to the field for early batting practice and we had a seven o'clock double header. You know, the, 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 the team would get there about five, um, but early BP would be like at about two. Yeah. Cause that way you can hit for an hour or so, then go treatment and then get back for five, right? You have, yeah. If you had to get treatment or something like that. So the early, early BP was two. So I would get to the field like around two. And let me tell you this. So Monica Abbott 
had this whole her, her warm up routine. Let me just tell you, I've never seen anybody in any sport go as hard as she goes in her war in her warm up. So let, let me just say this: she shows up in like she's not even in uniform. She's like in shorts, you know, a shirt. And she's actually working out. She's doing a workout. Wow. Right? So I'm like, so we're like, maybe she's not pitching. Yay. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Nobody wants to face yeah. Monica Abbott. So we're like, okay, yeah, she's not pitching today. Because there's no way she's freaking pitching today if she's doing all that. That's, that's what I'm thinking, right? All of a sudden, I kid you not, she gets on her uniform, she takes a shower, gets her uniform on, and she's freaking pitching. I'm like, what? You just did a full workout. But, like, oh but let me just say this also. We had girls like Tanya Callahan on the pride team and stuff. And I would see them coming back from like the gym and do like a full leg workout on game day in the morning. So it's something to be said. I mean, it's something to be said about how pros, elite pros, really go about their day to day. Because we don't see what they do. No. We don't see what they do in the morning that day we don't really see what they do and a lot of these a lot of these pro athletes go hard stacy nelson used to go hard yeah like people I, I, people who know like what, what went on in the background back in the day when she was at florida she went hard pre-game and on her off days her supposed off days mm. you know um I, I don't think people go hard enough or are willing to go hard enough it's like you do the minimum now I have one kid. Um, she just committed to Michigan, mm -hmm. and she gets up at 5 a.m. and does her workouts with her personal trainer. She's been doing it for years. Then she gets up, takes a shower, goes to school. She does practice, and then she'll come and do a lesson every single day. She'll either do a slapping lesson, a hitting lesson, or um, a pitching lesson. And then she'll end up going back to her travel ball team and doing stuff there. And then she goes home and does her work every day. Yeah, that's why she's where she's at. It goes back to my last podcast about the elite mindset. You know, we talked about, you gotta listen to it. We talked about how elite is not something you sign up for. It's not, it's not the travel team you play for. Elite mm, is good. your mentality. You yeah. have to have an elite mentality mm -hmm. to truly be elite. And those are yeah. just perfect examples of why Monica Abbott is the freaking stud that she is. And I think everybody has to do what they have to do. Everybody's different. Not saying you gotta do what she does, but there's something to be said about what yeah. you said about Let's activate the body in a certain way before yeah. we actually pitch a ball. You know? Um, yeah, so. Yeah. So, um, look, I don't want to keep you. I know this has been a long podcast. I'm probably going to break it up into two parts. Maybe I won't. Maybe I will. Maybe I won't. We'll see. We'll probably do like part one and part two. Um, I'm really glad I was able to get you on. It's been, it's just, it's been hard chasing you around. Oh, no. <laughs> Trying to get you to do this podcast, but I'm happy that I got you. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I'm, I'm coming to Alabama. Um, April, what do I have? April 19th on the calendar? Yeah, I think you said either 18th or 19th, but I think I sent you a message, so that may have to change. Why? Remember, I'm not in town on the 19th. That's the date that you said you're going to town? That's the one I'm going to be with Van in Mississippi. Okay, so I'll go back and um, figure yeah. it out. Maybe we do the following week. Maybe we do the 26th. Because okay. I think it was Easter. Easter was the week before that, right? No, Easter was the 8th or something like that. Yeah, I don't know. Easter weekend was all right. I'll figure, I'll, I'll figure it. I'll, I'll tell you the date. We'll get it. We'll get it popping. I'm, I'm looking okay. forward to coming down there. We're gonna do this lab down there and um, yeah, bring some technology and see what we got. Um, all right, awesome. So, can you let everybody know one more time how they can get in touch with you? Um, you can find me on Instagram or Facebook, Foster Fast Pitch. Um, you can also um, email me at kick. Do I need to put my email down? Um, if you want, just, just social media. Um, you can also email me at kfball at me.com or you can go to fosterfastpitch.com my website and you can sign up for lessons get the courses message me from there thank you Kelly and we will You're talk welcome. to you soon um, and hopefully we get you back really soon yep I'll be, okay. I'll be back soon okay thank you alright loved it bye right. see ya have a good, have a good